This is probably going to be my last video for a while on the topic of Gnosticism and the real-life effects and repercussions that happen when someone decides to adopt this worldview. But my three previous videos on the topic have left a couple of loose ends that I really want to finally tie up. In the previous video, we talked about the way that that conclusion that spirit is good and matter is bad, that's the natural first assumption that comes out of the Gnostic narrative, is as short-sighted and limiting as the opposite narrative, that matter is good and spirit is bad, which is also clearly wrong. However, it's a useful model to know about, that spirit and matter are two separate things and largely at odds with each other, but that doesn't mean that they are incompatible. The living proof of this is ourselves. A perfect nexus of the two worlds synthesized into one being that has both a physical body and agency in the material world, and a spiritual body that has agency in the spiritual world. Now, we're not talking about two beings overlapping, but one being with manifestation in several realms. There have been tales in the Jewish tradition suggesting that the angels envy our multiple nature. That sounds to me like just a way of saying, aren't we lucky to have a multiple nature? Not necessarily that there are actual angels out there that spend their days resenting us for how lucky we are. And this is kind of where I want to get to with today's video. The narrative versus the reality that's being pointed at. Okay, so where do we start? The human mind is wired to pay attention to gossip. On a very basic level, it's a helpful hardwiring that's designed to keep us safe from the bad actors in our society. Maven stole Phyllis's cows? Maybe be careful around Maven. Bernard punched Cecil in the bar last night? Well, maybe be careful around Bernard, or at least find out what it was about. Maybe it's Cecil we need to be aware of. One way or another, we've gathered information that will potentially help us make decisions in the future that will tip the scales towards security rather than danger. Obviously, if we leave this natural affinity for gossip unchecked, it's no surprise that it becomes a problem. Doreen was wearing a pink top at the party last night. I wonder whose husband she's trying to steal, and so on. The celebrity magazines thrive on taking advantage of this. Let's call it a feature of the human brain, this tendency to light up and pay attention when dirty details are being dished out about someone we know or think we know. All the best stories, the memorable ones, the ones that grip our attention and stay etched in our imagination, are the ones that introduce us to characters that we learn to care about and then put them in situations with betrayals, dilemmas, falling in love with the wrong person, conflict, misunderstanding. That's the kind of thing that keeps those stories in our mind. And these are the anchors that a non-literate world would use for ensuring the continued succession of their oral spiritual tradition. Zeus cheated on his wife again. What? Again? What happened? And suddenly the story is still around 2,800 years later. So it's normal that societies that would rely on memory rather than written scripture to access their collective spiritual record would resort to these kinds of highly effective narrative tools. He did this, she did that behind his back, he found out, she tried to fix her mistake but it was too late, and so on. Very compelling. But here's the core point I want to make today. The narrative is not to be mistaken for the reality that it was set up to describe. We all know the old adage that the wise person points to the moon, but the fool looks at the finger. Now, if, like me, you've assimilated the Gnostic narrative into your life, you can't dodge the big question you have to ask yourself. Am I so dazzled by the narrative that I've missed the reality to which it points? Somehow, and maybe not surprisingly, it feels infinitely easier to apply this exercise to other people's religions and faiths and beliefs. Indra's net, the universe-sized net with a gem at every intersection where two threads meet that reflect every other gem on the net? Sure, that's evidently a reference to the holographic nature of mind. Each one of us a reflection of each other and of the whole. 
What's that? God made us all in his image? Ha! <laughs> you know some people are so stupid that they believe this means that God must also be some kind of homo sapiens. Why isn't it obvious that we're talking about the total mind and each one of our minds being a reflection, in fact a complete instance of that mind at large if only we could just fully realise ourselves as the Christ mind? What's that? The Demiurge is a lion-headed snake who keeps us trapped in a cage? Ah, oh, man, just my luck. Somehow I had a feeling, you know. Uh, I bet he's looking at me right now, biding his time, plotting how to kill me. Uh, what's that? A, a metaphor also? <laughs> yeah, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, you get the idea. People who are adamant that literalism is a scourge of other people's religions unable to step back and see the same problem applied to themselves. Two quick notes here. N number one, I don't think it's their fault. Perspective only comes easily when you're considering other people's situations. Perspective about our own situation doesn't come naturally. It requires an abnormal amount of self-reflection, which, let's be honest, not everyone has time or headspace for. Those who do are privileged, certainly not the norm. And number two, I don't think the creators of these narratives intended to trap their readers. Sometimes the unexpected side effects that accompany an intended outcome are just that, unexpected. Maybe the writer didn't expect someone who was so educated that they could read to take the story literally. So this leads me to the question I promised I'd tackle at the end of my previous video on the missing element of Gnosticism. What are the repercussions for Solomonic magic? Essentially the magic that we can find in medieval and renaissance grimoires that call to various names of God in various directions in order to communicate with various entities from angels to intelligences to geniuses to demons. What to do now that we know that the god of Genesis is the Demiurgos and the bad guy of the story? Should I be calling his name? Should I involve him at all in my rituals? Stop. Wait. Calm down. The god of the Old Testament is a metaphorical narrative pointing to a deeper truth that's not directly of the material realm, and so we can't put it into sensory language. The Bible uses sensory language to approximate what it's trying to convey because that's what language essentially is. Sounds and signs to convey a sensory experience to another person or as a note to self for later use. Here, language is used to convey a non-sensory message, so obviously the potential for confusion creeps in. But I expect that this isn't news to most people watching my channel. I I've made enough videos about the nature of language and its effect on reality for you to at least guess that this is my opinion. And just in the same way, the idea of a demiurge is a metaphorical narrative also pointing to a sensorially undefinable, deeper reality. In fact, I believe that this narrative points precisely to this phenomenon, that the idea of a thing is not equal to the thing itself. Meister Eckhart put it quite beautifully when he wrote, I tell you the truth, any object that you have in your mind, however good, will be a barrier between you and the inmost truth. Or maybe more famously, we have the opening line of the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of 10,000 things. Now right there, the mother of 10,000 things. Maybe this rings a bell in the context of Gnosticism. In any case, from a practical perspective, I think we have to remember that the people who created the Solomonic grimoires were not writing them with any awareness of the Gnostic cosmogony or cosmology. This was simply not their paradigm. When they invoke the Tetragrammaton, the four-lettered name of God, they are invoking the highest authority from their perspective. The Tetragrammaton isn't God, it's a name, a placeholder to signify a deeper reality. 
the deeper reality it stood for at the time and for those people was the highest authority. Now, if we rearrange what that name stands for to now signify the idea of God, which is not God and which is a cause of great suffering in the world, well, I would say that that is not an ideal authority to call upon and most certainly not the intended meaning of the grimoireists. So now, how do we get around that if we've taken on the Gnostic paradigm? Well, we have two options. The first option is that we don't. As an adept of a religion that never really took off, many centuries after its creation, even millennia, we find ourselves with a distinct lack of advanced spiritual technologies such as the ones laid out in the grimoires. So, if we want rituals that fit our paradigm, we have to build them ourselves. We don't have a rich history of millions of adepts in our religion's past. So no, no one has done the work for us. If we want the technology, we're going to have to get our own hands dirty. But there's the second option, and that is chaos magic. Now, this isn't for everyone, of course, but then neither is any path. One of the core practices of chaos magic is the practice of switching paradigms. You can probably work out the rest for yourself, but the most important message here is that there's really no overlap between the grimoireists' Christian paradigm and the paradigm of the Gnostics of late antiquity. So adapting their work to work with your paradigm, whatever it may be, Gnostic, pagan or anything else for that matter, should be assumed to be akin to adapting the spiritual technologies of any other completely unrelated religion. And yes, the question of whether we should be doing that or not is definitely beyond the scope of this video. I'm only pointing at what the practice implies, and hopefully it's of some use. What about you? Do you have any thoughts on how Gnosticism and grimoire magic may or may not be compatible? Or tips on how you've managed to integrate practices from different and even incompatible paradigms? Do leave a comment. I'm always fascinated to read your thoughts. Now, I was saying in the beginning of the video, I think this is all I have to say about Gnosticism for now. I'm looking forward to getting stuck into some divination for a bit. See where those avenues of research take us. So yes, you can expect some videos on astrology and cartomancy and geomancy and chiromancy. Why not? Who knows? Either way, should be fun. In the meantime, let me just remind you that I do one-to-one -one video consultations and you can find the details on how to book a session with me just down below. And I'd like to also take a moment now to say thank you to all of the Foolish Fish members, both from YouTube memberships and from Patreon, for your incredible support. And in particular, I want to thank the Level Infinity, Lux Eterna members, Caitlin Kopok, David Venturini, Amu Moon, Linda Hendricks, Stephen Hunter, and the Eldritch Keeper. And also a huge thank you to all the level 3 Magister Venerabilis members whose name you can see scrolling up on the left over there. Thank you all so, so much. Please remember to click on the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video as well as on the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And of course, if you click on the little bell button next to the subscribe button, that just ensures you get to see my videos on the, your YouTube homepage whenever I release a new video. Thank you for watching. Look after yourselves, look after each other and see you very soon with another video.